refer to the prophecy of the one who will bring balance to the force. You believe it's this boy? He can see things before they happen. He can help you. The force is unusually strong with him. He was meant to help you. Anakin! Tell him to take off! Will I ever see you again? What does your heart tell you? Are you sure about this? Trusting our fate to a boy we hardly know? Anakin Skywalker, meet Obi-Wan Kenobi. I sense much fear in you. The boy is dangerous. They all sense it. Why can't you? Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Please welcome the host of the Celebration Stage, Mr. Warwick Davis! Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Celebration, and welcome to this very special celebration of the 20th anniversary of The Phantom Menace. You up for some Phantom Menace action? Yes. Fabulous, and welcome to everybody who is viewing from the, all the corners of the galaxy via the live stream as well. Hello to all of you. Before we get started and uh, celebrate this wonderful film, I'm going to say hello to our best seats in the house, as I always like to. Let's see who we have up here this afternoon, or this morning even. Okay, I'm just going to grab the microphone here. Hello. Who are you? Zoe. Zoe and Zoe, are you excited to be sitting here? Yes. Now, you're probably too young to remember when this film came out, but uh, have, you, uh, have you become a fan since? Yeah, yeah, and this is your dad here. Hello. Hello, who are you? Uh, Sai. Sai, so uh, you're obviously a Star Wars fan, which brings you here, but uh, in particular, uh, episode one? Um, all of them. You all take, of them. Take, take them all on, yeah. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Fantastic. Especially today, episode one. Though. Excellent, yeah. excellent. And we see somebody here in a, a George Lucas style shirt. <laughs> uh, how you doing? Good, how are you? Excited to be here? Yeah. Fantastic. There was somebody really uh, making a lot of noise here when the trailer came on. Who was that? Somebody was like, yeah, yeah. It was you back there, sir. Yeah, are you excited about this panel? A little bit, yes. A little bit, yeah. And who are you, uh, are you most excited to see? Well, how great is Ray Park? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Sure is. Sure is. But real, real quick, my, I, I'm, I'm with my best friend here. We're celebrating 20 years together. We met at Toys R Us in line for Episode One Toys. Fantastic. <laughs> and uh, what does the uh, what does the Phantom Menace mean to you? Well, the Phantom Menace. It's been something special. I got a godson out of the deal. But uh, I. <laughs> We love Star Wars, right? And we love it. Ray Park, it's, it's fantastic. Thank you very much. Our, our best seats in the house, ladies and gentlemen. There they are. OK, cool. Enjoy the show. Now, you know, it's hard to imagine now, but uh, there was a time many, many years ago that our galaxy was devoid of Star Wars, except for our treasured original trilogy of films. George Lucas had teased us with mentions of a much larger story, the Skywalker Saga. It promised to tell of the origins of the galaxy's greatest villain, Darth Vader. And also, hopefully, provided a role for yours truly. <laughs> to that end, in the early 90s, I set out on a campaign to ensure I was not forgotten when George finally sat down to write episode one. I sent faxes to him to let him know I was excited to hear that there would be more Star Wars and not to forget me. <laughs> as I was very much available for work. <laughs> now, probably tired of reloading his fax machine with fresh rolls of paper, George finally succumbed to my barrage of faxes and wrote me the part of Wald, described as Anakin's best friend. Thank you. It's exactly what I thought. Yes, I would be going back to that famous galaxy far, far away after 15 years away, a place I had fallen in love with as a fan in 1977 and then explored as Wicket the Ewok when I was 11 years old. 
Now, Star Wars is all about story and drama, action and memorable characters. My pleasure. But it is also made up of fascinating worlds, unique designs and imaginative crafts, each brought to life in vivid ways by true creative masters. Let's take a look. George knew right away that he wanted something very sleek, and so I started referencing 50s-style automotive hood ornaments. We went out to the ranch and saw 3,500 storyboards, and my reaction just about every board was, well, that's going to be really hard. We got a whole slew of digital characters that needed to be recorded whose voices weren't even worked out yet as far as creatively. The real creative time is almost before you've done anything. You're just thinking about it. That's happened to us more in this show, I think. Please welcome the behind the scenes masters of episode one, Gene Bolte, John Knoll, Doug Chang, and Matthew Wood. <laughs> welcome everyone. Thank you. Isn't Thank this you. fantastic? It's 20 yes. years now. Would you believe it? Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> Crazy. I love it. <laughs> and, uh, well, I mean, before we get started, have you been enjoying celebration here this year? Yeah, it's, the energy's been amazing. It's, Everybody's great. Well, these guys make it, don't they? Absolutely. It's my first celebration, and I have... <laughs> I can't tell you what it means to me to have you all be interested in what we do. I know you, you're interested in seeing the stars, but to come out and and support what we've contributed, it really means a great deal to us. Now, John and Doug, you attended a very early meeting with George when he was thinking about doing this movie. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, Doug had obviously been on the, the show for about a year or more before I was first exposed to what we were gonna deal with, but I think I mentioned in the video clip, uh, my first real exposure to what we were going to deal with was the 3,500 storyboards, uh, almost every one of which contains something that uh, our pipeline at the time was not capable of doing. So I was kind of taking notes, uh, like every couple of boards, like, eh, we're going to need a way of doing that. Huh? <laughs> and uh, the list was pretty overwhelming. So yeah, I walked out of that meeting with my head spinning. I mean, George, he has a way of challenging you, doesn't he, pushing the technology. He comes up with ideas that you couldn't currently do, but you had to invent a way he of doing it. absolutely does not restrict his thinking to, to what he knows is, is something that we can do. His expectation is, oh, well, you'll figure it out. Yeah, well, that's what makes him such an innovator, doesn't it? And that's what, in, in turn, has, yeah. has made ILM one of the best defense I mean, houses was, in the world. That was the scariest part of the show, but it was uh, it's also the most exciting. Mm. You know, the, the best shows to work on are the ones where you, you have no idea how you're going to do it when you go into it. <laughs> It's, uh, it's going to be an adventure, and I've got a lot of really talented people all around me, and we are going to figure it out. Absolutely. And, and Doug, uh, tell us about your first meetings with George and what, he, uh, what kind of vision he, he gave to you to, to run with. No, it was actually pretty terrifying because I mean, I've already, I was at ILM in 89 and when George made the announcement in 94 that he was actually going to make new films, I'd only seen him a couple of times in the hallway, so I never really spoke with him. And I remember when I got the job to head up the art department, we had our first meeting at, in his office at Skywalker Ranch and I remember just coming in and speaking with him and I completely blanked out. I was just looking at him talking and I didn't realize at that time he was actually giving us a design brief in terms of all the things that we were supposed to do. So I finally, I finally realized Oh, I better start writing this down. And I just grabbed any piece of paper. There were napkins on the table. <laughs> and I just started listing all the things that he wanted to do. And slowly, I started to like, realize, oh, man, what did I sign up for? Because it was completely overwhelming. I loved what I was hearing him say, but I had no idea how we were even going to approach this. Mm. Now, John, there were three visual effects supervisors on the film, uh, Dennis Muren, Scott Squires, and uh, yourself. Which sequences did you and your team handle? Uh, well, I, I was on first, so I got to pick all my favorite stuff. Oh, so. right. 
I kind of deliberately picked uh, uh, all the Tatooine work, the pod race um, in particular was something that appealed to me a lot. I mean, I, I got into this partly because uh, of the original Star Wars and space battles are just something near and dear to my heart. So like, I want to do all the space work. Wow. Um, did all of the uh, stuff inside the Neimoidian ship. Um, and uh, I did about half a course on it. Wow. And I think people would be surprised to, to learn that, you know, there was still a lot of practical model effects involved. Oh, yeah, yeah. How, how did they a feature? A huge amount. In fact, it's, uh, I, I think it's, it's the biggest model production that uh, we ever did at ILM and maybe mm. ever on any film. Really? Yeah, it's huge. So you use the models, what, to base the, the computer-generated imagery on? Or that no, the no, we, we built a lot of models that we shot directly and are what you see in the movie. You know, all of Theed City is miniatures. Uh, pod race, stadium, that's all miniatures, the hangar. Uh, the extensions inside the Neimoidian ship, the hallways and the, the oh, yeah. bridge. Wow. Uh, yeah, there's miniatures all over the place in that film. Wow. Now, Gene, you headed up the model shop at ILM at that time. Tell Actually, I was that. working in the digital model right. shop at that time. I see, I see. So uh, in what way did you take what, what John was doing and kind of uh, you know, uh, work with that? Well, I was given beautiful artwork by Doug Chang. And so my job was to interpret that. And there wasn't a great deal that I needed to add to it because the artwork was, was so well realized. But still, you have to take it that extra step. Mm. And so a lot of the creatures, the pods, well, basically anything that was computer generated um, was something that came through my department. That's Gene painting Sebulba. Oh, wow, yeah. So, Gene, you're working there on um, what was the first 3D paint program that you helped to develop for episode of. Well, the, uh, the first 3D paint program actually was developed for Jurassic Park. And Dennis Mirren said that. Well, I hate to make it sound like my job was the most important one, but he did say that it, it's what took computer graphics a huge step forward. I mean, what we, what we do when we add paint to it is we, we give it the, the color, the texture, the scale pattern, fur, feathers, but also uh, rust and scratches. And what we're doing with these things is giving them a story in addition to making them look real. Why did they get bumped here? What what's scraped that? And uh, the paint program, although it was still in its infancy, was capable of taking us to, to be able to do the throughput that we had to do for this astonishingly huge show. But you always probably wanted to do more with it than it was capable of at that time, yeah? Of course, and that's why we continue to evolve. And there's still more to do with, our, uh, with my work and what we do, but it has come a long way since those days. Now, we, we saw you working on Sebulba there, but you worked on many different characters. Do you have a particular favorite? It's, you know, I think, I mean, Sebulba and Jar Jar and... Um, um, two, I have to mention two of them, really, because I was given the great honor of being able to to work on Yoda, the digital version of Yoda. And there is no uh, character, in my opinion, that is more impressive than working on Yoda. What Frank Oz and Stuart Freeborn were able to achieve with Yoda is one of the best characters in any film anywhere, if you ask me. And so uh, that was a huge honor. But I have to say that another one that was a b very big favorite of mine was Watto. And I think it's because Watto is a junk dealer, and that's actually very close to my heart. I do a lot of collecting stuff in order to bring realism into my work. It's not only bones and snakeskins, but you know, pieces of metal and welding. And I think that if I didn't have this career, I might have been just fine with a folding table at a flea market, just dealing junk, because <laughs> I'm fascinated in collecting those things. Brilliant. <laughs> now, Doug, uh, you and your team essentially designed the entire look of the film. If you look back 20 years, are there any designs that you're particularly proud of? Wow, there, there's quite a few. I mean, what you see on the screen is actually only a small percentage of what we actually, you know, designed. Because George at that time was really exploring the palette, and we were laying down the foundation for all the designs. So for me, I mean, my, my personal favorite is actually the pod race. I, I, that was something that when I first heard the design brief for that, I really was attracted to it. Because, you know, I love car racing as well, and I love the idea that George was pushing that idea even further 
And I remember the very first time, I mean, you know, when he said that, I, I really, I, I heard what he said, but I didn't really listen because I was trying to put a practical thinking cap on and say, so, thinking that, you know, you can't be serious. You really don't mean to fly two engines that are untethered together. And so my <laughs> early designs, I tied them together because I thought that was the only way you could really fly it. And I had completely forgotten that that was the whole point. That was why George was coming up with the pod race. He wanted to make it a really wild spectacle. Brilliant. And, and um, you're essential in designing the prequel era, which has since carried into Star Wars into the 21st century, uh, influenced everything from the Clone Wars to the new feature films. Now, how conscious were you at that time of, of that potential, and, and did you feel the pressure? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that was one of the first things. <laughs> On the very first day, George said, you know, forget everything about what I thought Star Wars is, because he wanted to really lay down the foundation. And we had a 32-year uh, you know, history, a gap to fill between episode one and episode four. And what I loved about what George was doing was he was being very smart. He wanted to lay down the whole timeline and make sure that the Star Wars universe was very cohesive because he never really considered it science fiction. He always thought of it as a period film. And so we were gonna approach the designs for episode one like a period film. And so the timeline that we actually uh, came up together was that episode one was gonna be more grounded in the 1920s and 30s, whereas the original trilogy was more in the 1970s. And that gave me a really great foundation to kind of anchor the designs. And that became a template for all the films now going forward. And so when you look at all the films, including Clone Wars and Rebels, there is a design continuity that makes complete sense. Great, and it's brilliant, it is very true. You know, all the films have their unique look of that era. Thank you. Matthew, yes. now you were involved in bringing Star Wars sound into the digital era. Uh, how did your early work on the film begin and what kind of technological advances were made for episode one? Well, you know, we had worked on the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles together, George Lucas and I and Ben Burt, and that, that was sort of our, our testing ground for making these prequel movies. And uh, George never really pigeonholed anything about our sound. He was basically saying, he wanted to do certain things, like similar to in the visual effects, and I was thinking in my brain, there's no way we can, I, I have, you know, unless we just really go nuts with the technology here, there's no way to achieve it. And so he financially backed a lot of crazy ideas from, I was, you know, in my early 20s, and he went for it. And uh, we did, we worked in, uh, in a nonlinear fashion, basically, because we were just five years out from working in magnetic based film. So it was all digital at that point. Uh, and so, a lot of the first things we uh, were asked to do were the pod race. And so he had all these ideas about the different engines and how every pod was going to represent the personality of each character. So I get to work with Ben Burt, who was my absolute mentor uh, on episode one. I, he came to me saying, yeah, so I might want to make a couple of things for these animatic sequences we're working on. It was a couple of years before the movie was done. And so Ben and was down in the basement working on these uh, ideas, making pods and um, and, and running around Skywalker Ranch doing stuff. So we, I went out and recorded anything I could get my hands on, anything, all, all different kinds of sounds for jet boats and helicopters and, and uh, unmuffled Ferraris and all kinds of crazy stuff at this custom racetrack I went to. And so it was just gathering sounds, bringing them back, getting them ready to go for the tech that we were putting in place for, for this movie, which was... Well, Momentous. the Padres, um, it's such a brilliant sequence, and I think what you forget when, you, when you're watching it, you get so carried away, but there is no music score, is there? It's yeah. entirely reliant on your, your soundscape Yeah, you music's really, I mean, obviously John Williams' music is incredible in this movie, but it's wonderful to also have the dynamics, yeah. To have the dynamics of a moment, the first lap of the pod race where there is no music and we're heavily relying on all the visual effects and all the sound to drive that scene, and we, we were given a huge, um, canvas to work with, and that was a, a blessing. I've never actually had an experience like that on a film where there's been such a long sequence where we can showcase our work like that. Mm. Now, George says that sound is a character, yeah. and it's 50% of the Star Wars experience. Um, you know, you can close your eyes, can't you, and you can recognize soundscapes from the prequel trilogy versus the original trilogy. Now, how did you approach creating a unique soundscape for these new films? Well, just like Doug's design in a lot of the movie, we wanted to make it sleek, and it wasn't really well-worn, because the original movies had this very gritty kind of feel that everything had been lived in, and it might be a hand-me-down ship you're in. And so uh, a lot of, just on the, even the simple stuff, like the way a door opens, it doesn't sound like a big kerchunk. It has a very smooth gliding sound. And we wanted to, we wanted to create a world that was going to have that, what Doug had created visually, we wanted to, to complement. So it's, it's a lot of that. And um, the pod race was where we got to get really gritty. And there was a lot, like it was, a, you know, Watt is a junk dealer, like you said. And so a lot of that material was 
used and thrown together and, and, and patched together to work like that. So we used a lot of analog, real world stuff, engines and, and, and machinery and, and to make that happen. Do you have a favorite sound from the film? Uh, Sebulba's pod I, is one of my favorites. It's so throaty, yeah, like the juxtaposition that we made between Sebulba's pod and Anakin's pod to make Anakin was this high-end Porsche that I had recorded and Sebulba's pod was basically a Ferrari that a guy kindly punched a hole in his muffler for, uh, for, the, for the movie. So we recorded a lot of that, so that had that really low throaty growl and that combined with a lot of the tech we used at the time to, 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 to make that happen, um, th that sequence and those two pods are my favorite. Brilliant, brilliant. I, was, I always say that, uh, that uh, Matt's work makes our work look better. Because he, yeah. he does such a good job of helping sell the illusion. So, yeah, uh, yeah I always feel like uh, you know, we, we look at the shots over and over again in the screening room uh, while we're working on them in silence because we're talking about the shots. But then it's always a, a real, it's sort of a gift to, to see the whole thing together with sound at the end. And it really completes the illusion. It's a symbiont circle. What affects you affects us with sound and visual. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, John and Matthew, you both had cameos in the film, didn't you? Can you tell us about those? Yeah, John, John actually shot my cameo, which was great. And then I recorded the, the sound of John's cameo. So we, that was also, yeah, something we did. It was a fun day. Very good. So where can we see you, John, for example? Yeah, uh, so I'm in, the, uh, yeah, I'm in the space battle. I'm the only pilot that you actually see get killed. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. so what happened? I mean, no other, no, you couldn't get an actor to do it, or? Uh, no, no, we, we, um, we, we second unit spent uh, a, a day shooting miscellaneous pilot coverage, oh. and I actually don't know what came over me, but uh, at one point I, I asked, hey, George, you mind if I be a pilot? <laughs> and, uh, and he said, yeah, all right, fine. And so, <laughs> so I got kitted up and uh, got in the cockpit. I didn't know whether they were going to use any of this at all. But uh, what George told me was that uh, uh, the reason I'm the, the only one you see get killed is it's a, it's a pretty short shot, and uh, I was the only pilot that had a beard, and because it was a short shot, they wanted to, they wanted to make sure there wasn't any confusion that somebody important got killed. <laughs> 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 so it, it, you know, it wasn't any of the, the, the more recognizable pilots. Like, oh, yeah, he's nobody. All right, yeah, okay. <laughs> and, and did you work on your shot? Yes. Yeah, the visual yeah. effects you did. Well, I supervised the space battle, so yeah, that was, yeah. So you made yourself look particularly good. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, you know, 26 Difficult. frames of glory, I think. Oh, yeah. wow, okay. Uh, Matthew, you, yeah. we saw you as... Uh... Yes, mine was, uh, we were, Robin Gerland, the casting uh, person on the film, and George were, yes, there it is, uh, were, were um, uh, I, taking notes on something. I, I, actually, they were talking about a, some scene they wanted to work on, and I was taking notes, literally standing in the doorway, just kind of lurking, not trying to interrupt them. And Robin kept looking at me, and George kept looking at me, and she's like, you know, do you want to go down to ILM later today? And I was like, okay. Yeah, because, you know, and George was like, yeah, Matt, you're kind of, you, you're kind of skinny and creepy. You could, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you might fit into that, uh, the costume, because they'd already shot some material that was going to be uh, cut out of the film, that, so they wanted to repurpose uh, Bib Fortuna for another scene. And I guess I fit the model there. And uh, yes, <laughs> that's before I had my direction from John, because I, I walked out on stage like that, and thinking, OK, Bib Fortuna, Michael Carter, like, you know, and John's like, um, we're going to go for a more serious bib in this one. So, I just really like, I, I was very serious in the whole thing, and I had to point at a light stand that was eventually going to be Job of the Hut to wake him up. So that was a really fun day, about five hours of makeup, and I got to work with Danny Wagner, an amazing makeup artist, and uh, lived a dream to be in a Star Wars movie. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. You know, um, my involvement uh, with episode one, obviously, as I told at the beginning of the show, came from me pestering George, but uh, there was a moment, actually, when he, he felt a little bit guilty about sticking me back inside a rubber head again, because uh, he said, you know, since, uh, since you did Star Wars originally uh, as Wicket, you've done a small movie called Willow, so I feel bad about Woo! sticking you back in the head. And uh, he said, well, have you play another character um, watching the pod race? And, uh, and that character ultimately became the character of Weasel, who you then see again in Solo. Um, but uh, is it true that, that, um, that when you were working on the effect sequence in there with Watto, you used to call it like the Willow shot because I had the long hair? 
in that shot. I'd heard that that's kind of how you name that shot, identified. It was like the willow mm, shot. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have hair extensions, by the way. That wasn't my own hair. And um, the lady that put them in that morning, she sort of glued them all in. And uh, come that evening, she didn't know how to take them out. So I had to go home like it and then have all my hair cut off to get these uh, extensions out. So, uh, yes, I do indeed suffer for your entertainment. <laughs> I think it's the only time we've ever cut from one character to another, by the way. We cut from your character, uh, Wald, yes. into, the, into the Willow type character. We cut, yeah, basically between they are you. Back so I think to that's back, the only time they? in Star Wars we do that, where we cut one actor into two cuts. It's yeah, great. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, now, Doug. Back to you, sir. You're still deeply involved with the creation of Star Wars. Just this week alone, we've heard you talk about your involvement with episode nine. Yeah. Disney's Galaxy Edge, Galaxy's Edge, and The Mandalorian. Now, what did you learn on episode one that has stuck with you and you've brought on to these projects? Oh, just about everything. I mean, the lessons that I learned from George kind of you know, influence everything that I do now, and even non-Star Wars films. And so, I mean, when I was working with George, I had the very good fortune to work with him for seven years while he wrote. And I would say those are probably the best seven years uh, because, you know, I was literally going to George Lucas's art and film school and with George as the instructor. And all my design sensibilities came from that working experience because you know, at that time I could draw pretty well, but I really didn't know how to design for film. George taught me how to design for film. And so, his influence, even though he hasn't like personally worked on any of these films, they're in there. Just like Ralph McQuarrie is kind of in everything that I do as well. <laughs> Thank you. So a lot of what you see like in Galaxy's Edge and also The Mandalorian is a lot of what I learned from George. So there is a bit of George DNA in everything. Oh, that's great to hear. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> Thank you. The ability to bring unique worlds, creatures, and breathtaking sights and visual effects to life has always been a main character of Star Wars. And we all thank you for your outstanding contributions and achievements, which has both expanded the realm of possibilities and provided amazing cinematic entertainment. Gene Balti, John Knoll, Doug Chang, and Matthew Wood. <laughs> Okay, uh, those four have left just in time because I feel a disturbance in the force. It was 20 years ago when we first heard those immortal words, always two there are. been well trained my young apprentice they will be no match for you the makeup and the horns and the lenses and the teeth you just can't help being naughty i really feel i know palpsy we've been intimates for the best part of 30 years Please welcome the dark side stars of the Phantom Menace, the Master and the Apprentice, Ray Park! You snuck up on me there, so... <laughs> How's it going? Um, yes. Oh. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. 
Ian, you gave me a fright there. You snuck up on me. I hadn't even mentioned your name. I was, oh, I beg your pardon. I was I giving get... Ray his moment. I got no worries. I'll go off again. Your you do, it all do it again. Go on. No, he's the master. <laughs> indeed, indeed. The master and the apprentice. Wow, this is amazing to see you two both together again here. Yeah. Fabulous. What a treat, yeah? Now, Ian, before we start, you know, yeah. I realise we're here today to celebrate the 20th anniversary of The Phantom Menace, but uh, after seeing your surprise appearance here at Celebration on Friday... Uh, yeah? ..for the Episode 9 panel, I do have to ask, uh, do you have anything to tell us? Well, you know... <laughs> Friday, um, I just happened to be in the area. So, uh, I thought I should just drop in for a laugh. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, I see what you did there. Nice. Nice. <laughs> now, when you wrapped filming on Return of the Jedi all those years ago, did you have any idea that 16 years later, you would be reprising your role again? No, 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 no. Because, as you know, um, Darth Vader chucked me down that tunnel. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's the end. But I did say to George, you know, when I came up for air, I, 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 I said, George, is, is he? And before I could finish the sentence, he went, dead, yes. I said, well, couldn't he perhaps? No. <laughs> He's dead. But it wouldn't it be interesting if, forget it, so, all those years later, when the prequels uh, became a reality, I, I got that phone call again, and I had a very brief meeting with George, as I did the first time. And he said, do you know anyone who wants to play an emperor? And I said, well, that might be me. Um, and he said, well, these two characters in the movie, there's this sort of uh, hypocritical politician. I thought, yeah, I could do that. Uh, and then there's this other guy who we don't really get to know uh, until later, but he's very dark and mysterious and kind of scary. And I thought, oh, that's the part I'd like. But I'm going to be a boring politician. So like everybody else, I didn't know that only two there were going to be. Wow, wow. Now, Ian and Ray, you were actually the first two roles filmed on day one of shooting. That's right, yeah. OK, so take us back there. What did the first day feel like, and what was the mood on set? Uh, Ian, we'll start with you, sir. OK. Um, well, it was, you know, once again, history was being made. That didn't seem a pretentious thing to say, because it was, <laughs> it was true. And uh, Rick McCallum, the producer, traditionally does the first clapper. Uh, clapper board. I can't remember if the board was digital then. I mean, practically everything else was. Um, and Ray and I were standing together, and just having been introduced, <laughs> he in his full makeup, and me, not in mine, but just in the hood with the nose sticking out. You know, I, I didn't need to go any further at, at that point, and we did that first scene together uh, in a few takes, and uh, off we went. Yeah, it was quite, I, pretty, um, I was pretty nervous, to be honest with you, because we'd been rehearsing for so long, and for me, being 22, I, I thought it was a dream. I thought someone was joking with me. I'm not going to actually play this part. And we were actually up, and I was next to Ian. And, of course, walking, saying, you know, talking, saying the dialogue in my Cockney accent. And uh, it's good. I, and I asked Ian, I said, is that all right? Do you think I'm doing OK? You know, and uh, so Ian really reassured me and, uh, and kept me calm. So it was good. There was a lot of fun and an honor to do that with you. And I still want to be your apprentice. Oh, really? OK. <laughs> we'll, uh, OK. We'll talk in private later. <laughs> now, Ian, I understand you weren't given much background when you played the Emperor in Return of the Jedi. That's true. You weren't told very much. You just, no, uh... no, it was all a mystery. In fact, I didn't even know he was called the Emperor um, when I first got the part, because I had a very brief meeting with George one lunchtime. And I went home, and the phone was ringing, and my agent was sort of screaming up and down, saying, you've got the part. I said, oh, that's great. What's the part? And uh, he consulted his notes, because, you know, he's very thorough. And uh, he said, oh, he's called the Emperor of the Universe. <laughs> I said, well, I guess we'll be doing it then. And that's what uh, that, that happened. So yeah. The Phantom Menace was the first instalment of his background story. That's right, yes. And, uh, well, as we all know, I mean, because Vader took over the world in terms of interest, you know, and evil dum. Um, George, I think maybe he'd always planned it, but decided to tell his story. 
Uh, I had no idea how much my character would be part of it. Um, and on the movie, it's the nature of these movies, and I love it, you know, nobody knows anything. And all the way through the movie, Liam uh, didn't know that I was playing both parts. Uh, no, and a lot of people didn't. And, um, you know, he just he flicked the pages, as this sort of, this sort of city, it's like, I'm not think I'm in those scenes, and I don't want to, no, I won't learn any of that. <laughs> and, and then uh, at the premiere, uh, when we said hi again, he said, it was you, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Now, as you've mentioned there, you know, not everyone, including some of the fans, knew that you were playing both characters That's there. That's right. Um, and I didn't know myself, I should say, until, until that first day. And I thought they'd made a mistake. You know, all the actors' characters get numbers. And I thought, and they don't make these kind of mistakes, but I thought, oh, I've been given the wrong number. Because I'm playing this senator, you know, and he's, I don't know who this sidious person is at all. And then I realized, you know. Wow. But to this day, nobody's told me that the two people were the same. You know, I had to work it out for myself. <laughs> <laughs> and then how did you approach the two different personas differently? I suppose you saw them as different characters totally, did you? Yes. Uh, well, of course, you know, Sidious was sort of like the emperor. I mean, he was the emperor, although not fully achieved physically, although certainly in intellectually. But George said a great thing one day uh, on the set. He said, you should think of your eyes, Ian's eyes, Palpatine's eyes as contact lenses so when you play the scene your face your face to you shouldn't really seem real and that was a fantastic note for an actor and it really made sense to me so uh it was difficult to shake off so when i went home you know i felt i was going around in this terrible mask and uh, people kept saying are you all right why are you staring at everybody but i was just practicing <laughs> brilliant now, Ray, Darth Maul is a man of few words, so movement has become important. It's your language, basically. And yesterday, sure. we heard Dave Filoni tell us that more action and fighting scenes created with motion capture from your stylized movement for the new Clone Wars, which yeah. is great. Yeah. Another secret that I kept for a long time, not telling my kids. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, we heard all about those secrets yesterday as yeah, well. It was a lot um, of fun. How did you originally create the sort of body language that Maul has? Um, well, as a teenager, I was very shy anyway. Mm. You know, I wasn't very good at chatting up with girls and trying to get, you know, I wasn't that kind of guy, but I, I was, my body was, is what I knew. And um, originally when I was brought in by Nick Gillard, I saw Darth Maul and seen the storyboards and seen the images. I saw Maul as like a, one of the distinguished kind of like master that you would see in the Chinese movies that doesn't really say much, but wouldn't look at you when he was doing action, but he, he was in full control. And, um, and, and I think just through my wushu background and gymnastics and, uh, and being a big kid, because I wanted to be a Jedi, it was just a, a, a dream come true for me. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and working with Nick as well and Andreas and, and all the other guys, it really helped bring everything together physically, and plus we were playing games like Tekken and Soul Edge, and you know, we were like copying things like that. And so we were having fun with the rehearsal and that sort of, we were just playing. And uh, we want, uh, one thing was we wanted to make sure, because as being martial art fans watching movies, we wanted to make sure the fans didn't see any faults in the fights. There was no loopholes. Everything was technical and, and, uh, and, and, and rapid and, and fast. And George wanted us to be super powerful. So. Absolutely. Now, there's one iconic moment in the movie when those doors open and you ignite your lightsaber. Yeah. Tell us about filming that. Well, it was great because I was listening to Prodigy at the time. And, uh, <laughs> and, and Fire, Firestarter was my theme for Darth Maul. And, uh, <laughs> and the, the new album, Fat the Land, just dropped. And, uh, Andreas was really into it, and we were both breakdancers back when we were younger. So I was kind of like getting myself geared up, like, I'm the fire starter. And, um, but really, what I was thinking was, when the doors opened was, oh, thank God I got that cloak off. I can't <laughs> wait. Because it was heavy, and it was beautiful, and it looked good, and um, it, the, the, the sleeves would get in the way, so it added a different texture to the fight in a desert with Leon, which was really, really cool. But um, 
there was so much more I could do without the cloak. So that little smirk that you see when I'm opening, the doors open, that's me like, yeah, <laughs> it's off. You're never gonna see it on again. And then, you know, and so, that's, so that's why there's a little smirk. That's brilliant, that's brilliant. Now, right, I understand you also have a cameo in the film, which many people might not realize. Yeah, I do. You do? It was on my, it was, I was on such a roller coaster of a ride, like I was, you know, buzzing from being on Star Wars, being so young and working and, and rehearsing fights and, and working with some wonderful people. Um, I had a day off and Nick gave me a day off and it was a Wednesday, I remember it because it was raining. And uh, I kind of like, was like making out, oh, it's a shame I got a day off, you know. And he goes, well, you can come in. Then, you know, you can, you, can, you can be a guard, guard. And I was like, what? And uh, so um, he brought me on and I was one of the, uh, the, the guards. Well, we're gonna take a look at that in a moment. But you know, you say that, exactly the same thing happened to me. I was out in Tunisia uh, filming uh, with the pod race sequence and, uh, and I had a day off and I didn't wanna just sit at the hotel. We were making Star Wars for goodness sake. So I went to the set and I was just sitting watching and George actually said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I've just come in to watch, you know. He said, well, I can't have you sitting there doing nothing. Go to the wardrobe department and the makeup department and make yourself look different. So I kind of got a load of costume pieces, put them on and, and had them make me up differently and, and went back on and uh, they put me in a scene just kind of walking through. Uh, and, and that day, Annie Leibovitz was there filming for Vanity Fair doing a photo shoot. And uh, I managed to get in those photos. So nice. it was quite a result. <laughs> there he is, yeah. Awesome. You don't want to sit around when you're working on a Star no, Wars movie, do you? You want to sit in a hotel not. room, you want to be out there doing stuff. Absolutely. Well, let's look yeah. at now the result of your cameo appearance. Go! Ascension guns! <laughs> Can I... Can I tell you a little story? I had to tame that down a lot. Uh, Rick McCallum, who I really got on really well with uh, on set, and George, um, they were right up on the stairs, and uh, Andres was there, and Nick was there. So I, I, want, I, tr I knew I was supposed to hide myself, but I wanted to get in front of the camera. So, so I'm walking, and as I, I come out, I, I hold the laser gun, and I sort of go. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, Rick goes, hey, Ray, Ray, we're not doing a Tarantino movie, okay? This is Star Wars. I thought you were going to say you kind of did a flip and a roll or something like that I, as I well. I wanted to, but the boots, you know, they got in the way. Oh, okay. <laughs> now, both of you, when you look back on your performances in this film uh, and the love that the fans have for your characters, uh, <laughs> are, you, are you happy with your performances? Start with you, Ray. I'm very grateful. I never thought when I was a kid at seven, year, seven, eight years old, seeing Star Wars and Empire. Empire was the movie that changed my life. And, and I, I, it, I decided I'm going to do martial arts and I'm going to be a Jedi and I'm going to do gymnastics. And um, I didn't, as a kid, I didn't grow up and say, hey, I'm going to be the bad guy. No. But um, I love it. I'm so happy. I would never, I would never change it. I've, uh, my life has changed because of Star Wars. I've, I've met so many wonderful people. It's a wonderful man, you know, and of course you, and you know, it's just we've met so many great Thank people you. along the way, and all of you guys too, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you, you keep me young and fit, you know? I have my moments when I want to eat my Oreos and a cup of tea and dip in 20, <laughs> and then I think about, you, I get a post from you guys, and I'm like, oh, I've got to be Darth Maul and Snake Eyes, get out in the gym, oh, come on. <laughs> so it keeps me motivated, so I feel I'm, I'm happy. So, uh, Ian, does it keep you away from the Oreos? Uh. <laughs> you know me too well. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Ray. It's, uh, it's kept me young and happy. Um, the, the thing that's, uh, which is wonderfully ironic, I mean, when I was 37, I think, I started out by playing 120, and, uh, or something along those lines, and then I went back to my own age, which was why I was able to do the part as the senator. Um, in, in the first movie. Um, but throughout my life since I was 37, every now and again, at interval, a Star Wars movie came along while I was doing other things, other movies, other TV things, but mainly stage work and also running a theater. In fact, when we were doing The Phantom Menace, um, I was very pleased that we were at Leavesden 
which was just about half an hour's drive from my theater, so I could go in and do a bit of work in the morning and then go and do a bit of filming. So it's been very much sequentially um, part of my life. Um, I was only very disappointed, of course, that at the end of Jedi, he was, as George said, no, he's dead. <laughs> so um, I made the assumption that we'd never, ever see him again. And I guess that's how it'll remain. <laughs> you tease. Well, thank you very much, Ian and Ray. Remain with us okay. uh, for the time being. Uh, Star Wars is about both the dark side and, of course, the heroes. <laughs> Episode one revealed many introductions and simple beginnings of a number of the most memorable and beloved characters. Take a look. We need a navigator to get us through the planet's core. This Gungan may be of help. I think everybody remembers when they were that kid who just didn't fit in. Oh, no! Get away! Oh, no! Get out of here! He has a good heart and he has good intentions and he wants to fit in and he wants to be with everybody else, but he just can't help it. He's just, he's just clumsy. <laughs> My turtle, Revenge. You're quite right. He's very odd indeed. He's a protocol droid to help mom. 3PO's always had a strange position in the world of Star Wars. I can't believe it. He is highly intelligent. Often he will tell the truth or give an opinion, but nobody kind of gets it. They will never get me onto one of those dreadful starships. Please welcome two of the most memorable and entertaining Star Wars characters of all time, Ahmed Best. <laughs> Ahmed, how's it going? How are you? Ahmed, <laughs> Ahmed, You guys are gonna make me tear up and I'm an unattractive crier. <laughs> well, happy 20th anniversary, gentlemen. Welcome. Has it Welcome. been 20 years already? 20 years, yeah. We all look good though, don't we still? Y'all look great. Well. <laughs> Now, Anthony, you still sexy. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's been 20 years since your characters each took... <laughs> Sorry, Warren. Have I got to separate you two? Maybe I'll, in a little I'll bit. stick you over here next to the Emperor. <laughs> that might you be know. even better. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, Anthony. Welcome. When do you first recall George mentioning that, uh, you know, he was going to make more films? Well, that, that was uh, many years before, before this event, because um, when I was invited to be in the Star Wars, yeah, back in 1975, it, there was just the one film. And of course, when it came out, we all know suddenly there was the one V number, and I looked up and it meant episode four, right? Mm -hmm. And at that point, it became common knowledge that George was saying he was going to do, uh, what, 1X, which would be 9. And I thought, well, nobody's ever going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> and, um, you know, then there was this, we shot all these uh, movies, number six it became, and then there was this tremendous pause in the universe, this sort of black hole of nothing for, what, 16 years? And I'd com sort of completely forgotten about the movies because I was busy doing all sorts of other things. But a lot of Star Wars stuff, like the exhibitions that you saw around the world, I would front those because, you know, I shared 3PO's ability to be an MC, and, and one day I'll show you how to do it, actually. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I was very popular at doing that, and, and I took uh, 3PO uh, and, and Star Wars uh, around the planet. And then this call to go to a place called Leaveston. Yes, so, uh, you know, a car came, and fortunately the driver knew where it was. And then there was George, you know, who, who was uh, just George with, you know, that voice. And uh, so, uh, 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 uh. 
and uh, your character, uh, your 3PO is um, mm, uh, kind of uh, made by uh, Anakin. Mm. And that sort of was the end of the conversation, and I was man of few words, and as you know, Ian. And uh, I was really happy that I was made by Anakin because Sir Alec Guinness had been so wonderful to me in those original films that to be created by him, I thought 3PO would be really proud until a few days later I suddenly, because I'd forgotten the details. All right, it was in the movies, but who's who? Too many people, do you know? Wait. Too many characters. But this was Darth Vader, for goodness sake. I know, that's what I was just coming to. That was my punchline, Warwick. Oh, I'm sorry. This was, well, I think, hang on a minute. Whoa, 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 punchline. They were way ahead of you. <laughs> they were way, they know their stuff. They know who Anakin Skywalker is. They know he's Darth Vader. <laughs> all right, all right, but it, it actually, it actually was a shock. Oh, it was exactly like this 20 years ago. <laughs> But, it, but look, to be realistic, it does explain, doesn't it, why 3PO is slightly nervous about everything. Because, but, but not that he actually, I think, knows that, that Darth Vader is his daddy, okay? So if anybody tells him ever, just it's your respons responsibility, live with the results. Because, you know, let's keep it a secret, okay? Yeah, okay. You're, you're good at secrets, aren't you, Ian? Yeah. <laughs> Now, you said just then uh, that you know you've, you've helped me over the years become a better host. Um, and and, but, and um, still it is a work in progress. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but one thing is uh, that I haven't learned from you, and uh, thankfully I haven't, is your, uh, your dress sense. Oh, oh my God. I, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, I, I had forgotten that, they're, uh, that this was on camera. Yes, Actually, it? they're not bad. No. What do we think? They were, no. Um, and a bit of a red heel there, which is, is a, a little bit, uh, how are you doing? Tribute to the dark side. Tribute. Thank you. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, no, you know, 3PO is very formal and so on, and I have my moments, and I think a sock is where to let those moments out. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, Armin, George has said that Jar Jar is his favorite character. <laughs> and that, uh, he wanted a silly, lovable, physical comedian that was like Goofy and Buster Keaton. And you gave him exactly what he hoped for. Yeah, hire a skinny kid from the South Bronx and you get all of that. <laughs> now, you were discovered for this role when you were a member of the stage show Stomp. Yeah, uh, Can I you discuss stomping. the differences between your physical performance on stage and your physical direction of Jar Jar? Um, well, Jar Jar was very much Buster Keaton and um, I was a huge Buster Keaton fan, Charlie Chaplin fan, Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee. Like, it was always physical for me, you know, mm. much like Ray. I grew up in martial arts, and I, I really uh, enjoyed being a physical person. And Stomp was extremely physical. You know, it's a musical with no words. And it was really about communication through uh, physicality and percussion. So when Robin Gerlin, who casted episode one, when she saw me in Stomp, she, was, she looked at me and the way I was moving, she was like, that might be good for what George is looking for. And then um, uh, she brought me to Skywalker Ranch, which was mad trippy. <laughs> yeah, um, so I, you know, growing up in the South Bronx, you never think that you would ever get a look like Star Wars, like no one, prepared me. There's no school for that. You know, when you're on the playground running for your life, you're like, in about 20 years, I'm gonna be in Star Wars, and all y'all are gonna fucking regret it. <laughs> you know, there is, there's never any of that. So, like, going to uh, Skywalker Ranch and then eventually screen testing at ILM in the, in the mocap suit and everybody going, we don't know what's gonna happen, just go do some stuff. And I was just like, I'm just gonna be as, as as physical as I possibly can and try to give George everything he wanted. Because that was brand new, that technology of motion capture, wasn't it? It was, it was you know, it was extremely cutting edge and um, there was a lot of questions. Like nobody knew how much to do, how much not to do. You know, the reason why I was in the suit was really um, as a backup in case the CGI didn't work or in case they needed the shot and they couldn't animate the shot. And, mm. you know, fortunately it was, um, you know, Industrial Lights and Magic and, and Lucasfilm, they're just so incredibly 
intelligent and talented and collaborative, you know, they let this young 20 year old kid be a part of this thing, you know, and really, really be a pioneer in, in the history of film. Anthony, um, absolutely. So obviously in The Phantom Menace, we see the origins of 3PO. What was your approach to playing him at that stage? Well, uh, of course, I actually wasn't uh, hefting the suit there because I, I did arrive on set to, to find Michael Lynch uh, wearing this um, extraordinary uh, puppet and he, he, from ILM, and he had created what, as we all now recognize, would be inside that you know, golden outfit. And it was a really surreal experience for me because there was Michael... Um, kind of not only being a wonderful puppeteer, but sort of uh, being me as a kind of, it was a weird thing, because I wasn't doing it, and 3PO wasn't kind of the way 3PO was in my mind, because I guess when you don't have all the outsides on, you move in a slightly more uh, fluid way. And um, it was it was quite magical to see him, and what I loved was the imagination um, to think that in fact 3PO hadn't always been a golden droid. Somebody had to make it. And you know, for people to say, you know, when 3PO says, thank the maker, who's he talking about? Well, obviously, not that he knows. He's talking about the guy who made him. In this case, it was Anakin. So to be on the set and see that was a slightly remote experience, frankly. And um, of course, the line I loved was, um, what do you mean, naked? Because, you know, R2-D2 is such a, like, uh, he's so rude. And, um, and he says, you know, but beep, 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 my parts are showing. Oh, my. And always, <laughs> always, actors always check their flies before coming on stage, don't they? So as an actor, you're, 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 you're faintly embarrassed at, at this. And I, I love that. Um, but it, it was quite a remote experience. And um, I didn't, in fact, meet many members cast until that first celebration all those years, 20 years ago now and that's where you and I were on stage yeah, together yeah, I will definitely. always remember you were fantastic you Thank walked you. out and just took over the whole thing but actually yeah I, I forgave him it was all right. actually it gave me a few minutes break I was so grateful I, I, I yeah um, but just to say just to take yeah just, all those people were there and I know some of you were there at the original celebration Wait a minute, wait for it, because down here to, to my left is the producer, the guy who put it all together for you, and he's just going to stand up. You won't be able to see him from where you are, but Dan Madsen, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we wouldn't be here today without, without Dan's original inspiration. And I love you for it, and they do too, Dan. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. It's a bit different to those tents, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, we, we talked a bit about it yesterday. To people who weren't there, it was like being in a war zone. We were drenched. We were walking in mud. And every, do you remember how everybody was smiling? You were there. Yeah, everybody seemed to love being dirty, as long as you were. Oh, look at that. Start. Yeah, that was it. That, that was, was it. That was crazy. And was... you know, guys, if you weren't there, there's a, what's that, um, uh, Ian, Ian, wake up. Yes. Um, Just traumatized. Traumatized. Yeah. No, what's <laughs> the Shakespeare play where somebody says, those people now are bad in England, will hold them manhood deep, uh, uh, that they weren't there? Etc. No, they weren't. Uh, Henry V, I think. It, it was Henry V yeah, or something. Yeah, it's St. Christmas Day. It, it was like this ba band of brothers, right? Hello, yeah, Bon Terry. Oh, look at that. Remember that? Ray? I remember that. The Jar Jar Jam. When I thought I could actually. Ah, uh, yeah. That was fun. Those, those were. A Wookiee shirt. That was uh, my favorite shirt. <laughs> ah, there is Dan. That's great. There's and Al. me. And, and you still got the same jacket. I, <laughs> I have, yeah, but I don't have jacket. the same hair, unfortunately. Look, I have black hair there. I remember a couple of Klingons crashed that in, in Denver. Really? And they, I don't think they got out alive. They were just, they got destroyed. It's, it's frightening. Yeah. Absolutely. Good times in Denver. And uh, isn't it wonderful here? 20 years later, we're still doing the same thing, but on a much grander scale. Fantastic. And you know, The Phantom Menace, 
that was the movie that started Celebration, because that was what we were there to celebrate, to talk about. So uh, without this wonderful movie, we wouldn't be here today doing this. So uh, thank you to The Phantom Menace. Absolutely. Thank you. So, Ian, Ray, Armand, and Anthony, we thank you for your brilliant contributions to The Phantom Menace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I'd like to ask Gene, Doug, John, and Matthew to join us once again as we continue our 20th anniversary celebration of The Phantom Menace. Here they are. Wonderful. Look at all of these marvellous people, artists and performers who contributed to this film. It's On fantastic. a Monday, too. I'm... <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We're all now, way um... more grey, too, than we were in <laughs> Phantom Menace. Now, today we're celebrating uh, the new beginning of the Star Wars saga, and that came from the very heart of Mr. George Lucas himself. Now, I've just received a personal message from George. Should we play it? Yeah? yeah? All right, then, let's take a look. Thank you for coming to the celebration. It's uh, one, one of my favorite movies, you know, and of course, Jar Jar is my favorite character. Ahmed, he did a fantastic job. It was very, very hard. Also for John Knoll and all the guys at ILM, I made it impossible for them. We broke a lot of ground. We were using test equipment. Uh, and, uh, but it was the beginning of digital. Even though we didn't get to shoot the whole thing digitally, we did shoot part of it. So it was really one of the first digital features. And I'm very proud of that. The fans are always such a big part of these films. And obviously, those of you who are here uh, are the fans of episode one. And, uh, I love each and every one of you. Wow. So, George, I want to personally thank you for allowing me to be part of episode one and of Star Wars, of course, and for casting these incredibly talented actors and filmmakers who have made a huge impact on the Star Wars galaxy. Thank you. Now, please allow me to... Uh, Take a moment to illustrate. Doug Chang, episode one was only the beginning of Doug's contributions to Star Wars design. He has since created some of the most iconic and original imagery in the entire saga. Doug's helped to lead design efforts on The Force Awakens, Rogue One, and Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, along with numerous other projects. The Academy Award winner is now Lucasfilm's vice president and executive creative director for Star Wars. Let's hear it for Doug. Jean Balti has been leading, uh, a leading artist in the world of visual effects for decades. She continued as viewpaint supervisor on Star Wars Attack of the Clones and remains an ILM to this day. Her 30-plus year career, one of the longest tenured women at Lucasfilm, has garnered dozens of feature film credits. A blending of handcrafted experience with technical innovation is an example to her fellow artists today and for all those to come. Jean Bolte. Thank you. Matthew Wood has remained an essential part of the Star Wars sound design team for 20 years. Uh, in addition to working on many other projects at Skywalker Sound. He's earned nominations for Oscars, BAFTAs and Emmy Awards. Matthew has perhaps voiced more Star Wars characters than anyone else in history. We continue to hear his work in many, many ways. Matthew Wood. John Knoll is a 30-plus year veteran at ILM and is now Chief Creative Officer and Senior Visual Effects Supervisor. He's won Academy Awards, including recognition just this year for his co-creation of Photoshop, along with his brother Thomas. Yeah. Thank you. 
He's even on the Board of Governors of the Academy's Visual Effects Branch. Of course, Star Wars is never far from John's work. As many of you know, John originated the idea for Rogue One and served as Visual Effects Supervisor on the film. Thank you, John. From the first time we saw his red and yellow eyes and game-changing double-bladed lightsaber, Darth Maul became one of the greatest baddies ever to thrill the big screen. Ray Park's physical agility and martial arts wizardry made us look at the possibilities of the dark side in a whole new and spectacular way. From the Phantom Menace to Solo, with quite a few celebration appearances in between, Ray is a Star Wars legend. Ahmed Best is a true pioneer in the art of Woo! motion capture. Woo! Woo! Multiple generations of young Star Wars fans have loved Jar Jar Binks in the prequels and the Clone Wars animated series, for which Ahmed reprised his iconic role. The Annie Award winner, or should I say, Annie Award winning, <laughs> winner continues to produce, write, and direct. He's a very talented, busy man, and an inspiring one at that. Ahmed Best. <laughs> a master thespian, Ian McDermott produced a powerful and unforgettably sinister character in both the original trilogy and in the prequels. And like Ahmed, has revived the character in Star Wars animation. He's also continued his lauded strange career and won a Tony Award in 2006 as Best Featured Actor in a play for Faith Healer. But for all of us Star Wars fans, Ian will go down in cinematic history for playing one of the most evil, manipulative and memorable villains of all time. <laughs> And, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think that's it. Um, <laughs> I think that's, uh, that's everyone. <laughs> Fitting tributes, I think you'll agree, uh, for the wonderful, talented people that have been involved uh, with these films oh, over the years. Um, oh, hey, no, hey, I, go, sorry, go, sorry, I'm so sorry. Sorry, it was, it's, it's only like a couple of words on here and I just missed it. Sorry, sit down. <laughs> sit down, sorry about that. Embarrassing. So I just, yeah. Uh, okay, just sit there and say, well, sorry about it. Excuse me, just forget that ever happened. <laughs> so, Anthony Daniels is brilliant. That's it. Okay, I don't. There's more, there's more, there's more, there's more, there's more. Anthony Daniels and the adventures of his golden alter ego, C3PO, have spanned the entire saga for more than 40 years. He's appeared in more Star Wars films than any other actor, even me. <laughs> He's also been a constant presence and ambassador for all of us fans here at Star Wars Celebration since the very beginning, 20 years ago. Anthony Daniels. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for all my special guests for sharing their incredible talents with us over the years. Thank you to all of you. Please join me downstage now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the cast and special effects wizards of The Phantom Menace. Thank you, each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. Well done.